Welcome, happy morning is the name of that piece. Good morning to you all. I'm Pastor Norman, and welcome to Havity Grace United Methodist Church, where we learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ to serve others and transform lives here across the street and around the world. We're glad you're here this morning, and a special welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. We welcome you also because you also are part of our Havity Grace United Methodist Church family. We hope wherever you are, you are safe. If it's your first time visiting with us or you've never gotten a letter from me, please fill out one of those little blue cards that's found in the pew rack, drop it in the offering plate, or sign the guest book on your way out because we want to connect with anyone who worships here with us. There is a clipboard cir- circulating around the space. You have permission to get up and pass it on to the next person. Uh, this is an opportunity to sign up if you want to make a financial donation to feed hungry people wherever we find them. So today is Super Bowl Sunday. So quick show of hands, how many of you are rooting for the 49ers? How many of you are rooting for Taylor Swift? (laughs) Now, how many of you are rooting for the Chiefs? All right. How many of you don't care and just want to watch the ads? Okay. All right. Very good. Today is also Transfiguration Sunday as we remember how Christ was transfigured on the mountain, and it's also Scout Sunday as we celebrate the ministries of Cub Scouts and our Scout troops. So we welcome all of you. They are participating in helping lead worship today. The Ruth Jessup Circle is sponsoring a Super Bowl season collecting non-perishable food items for Grace Place. Check the bulletin for what is needed. Today is the deadline, but if you bring it in later this week, we will send it to Grace Place. Also, out in the narthex in the Welcome Center and also out in the red cupboard under the breezeway are some homemade Valentine's slash thinking of you cards that one of our students made for her Patriot Project, and you are free to take those and use them and and greet people using those cards. There are available in the narthex, also in the red cupboard, some uh, Lent devotional booklets. You're free to take those. And they are daily devotion running from Ash Wednesday through Easter. So if you want to add a a Lenten practice to your usual spiritual practices, this is an opportunity to do that. A quick reminder to those who are cooks for the emergency winter shelter, please pick up your your kits from down in the social room today. If you forget, they'll be in the red cupboard later this week. Meals are due in on Friday. Also out in the narthex in the... Welcome Center are some purple forms like this. If you want to place, instead of placing lilies for Easter, if you want to make a mission gift in honor or in memory of a loved one, fill out the form, attach a check, and follow the directions on the form. It's an opportunity to honor loved ones and extend our ministries here across the street and around the world. So friends, we're in sacred space. We're invited into sacred time. So let's all take a deep breath in. And let it out slowly as we center ourselves in the presence of God's Holy Spirit and invite Torin to call us to worship. Torin. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Or, sorry, I apologize. Uh, please stand and heart our bodies. <laughs> Let us walk in the light of the Lord. That he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. Let us worship God. Praise the Lord. Uh, this is the announcement of God's peace. As a sign of the reconciliation Jesus Christ has made between us and God, and our desire to be reconciled with others, we announce God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. <laughs> now like to invite Terrell to present the color guard. Color guard, attention. 
Kyle Guard advance. Color guard, host the colors. Will you all please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color guard, about face. Color guard, you may be seated. Scout signs. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, and reverent.
Please be seated. <laughs> Opening prayer. Lord God, we come with many questions. We wonder about you and your way. Speak into our hearts this hour and give us your answers. Help us hear your word. Remind us that you are always ready to hear our questions because you love us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Elijah had been a great spokesman for God, but was getting old. He had an assistant, Elisha, who traveled with him. Soon Elijah would be taken to heaven. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elisha said to Elijah, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have, a, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted for you. It will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into, in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the charlots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. Jesus has predicted his violent death and his resurrection while teaching the people. Soon he will go to Jerusalem where he died, but for now he spends some time alone with his closest friends. Six days later, Jesus took, him, took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he went transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white such, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to be and there appeared to them Elijah and with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? Let us make these, let us make three dwelling, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say for them, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, Why did, this, why did the scribes say to, that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How, is that, how, how then is it written about the Son of Man and that he is going that he is to go through many sufferings and to be treated with contempt. 
But I tell, I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they please, as it is written about him. This is, this is the word of the Lord. So now I want to invite all those who are elementary school age to come down front and just have a little chat with me, and you can sit on the floor or sit on the front pew on the front bench there. So all the children who are here are welcome to come and join me for just a moment. And as you all are coming, I want to welcome those who are worshiping online. So some of our young people are out there. I want to say hello today to Emmy and Ashlyn and Molly and Lola, and to Amira and Rory and Jill and James and Charlie, and to Zoe and Scout and Breezy and Taylor and Maddie and to Jasper and Charlotte and Bodie and Ian, and to Iris and Hazel. And if I miss saying your name, I welcome you too, and I'm glad that you're joining us online. So, I have a question for you. And this first one, just raise your hands if you've ever been camping. Anybody here ever been camping? All right, lots of you have been camping. What are some things that it's good to take with you when you go camping? What sort of things might you pack? Um, a camp, I mean, a, um, a tent. I'm a not tent? Say a, tent. a tent? Flashlight. Flashlight. A backpack. Backpack. Food. Food. Drinks. Drinks. Any other ideas? Um, wood. Wood, if you, if you need some firewood, if it's not there, yeah, you might, or maybe you want to make sure it's dry, right? Yeah, yeah, what else? A tourniquet. A tourniquet, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is some extreme camping. Uh, probably a sleeping bag. Sleeping bag. A compass. A compass, yeah, for navigating, yeah. Lots and lots of things. I got a picture up here of some scout gear, some, some camping gear, right? Lots of gear you might want to take with you to go camping. Here's what I want you to think about, though. How many of you have seen that picture? It's a famous picture of the Earth taken from outer space. Looks like a blue marble. Have you seen that picture? Raise your hands if you've ever seen that picture of the Earth taken from outer space, right? The thing about that picture, what we realize when we see that is how small the Earth really is. In the vastness of space is this one little round planet on which we live. And I like to think that us living here is a little bit like camping all the time. Because when you go someplace and you camp, you're only there temporarily, just for a while. And then you leave and you go home. And what's the scout rule about when you leave a campsite? I know you have a thing you say every week. What's the scout rule about? Um, leave it where you... Um, how you found it. Leave it how you found it, right? Yeah. Okay. So what I like to think about is here we are. We're, we're temporarily camping out on this, this round world, this globe, this earth. And that, that earth is a gift to us. God has given us the earth. And everything we see around us and all the water and all the air we breathe and all the stuff we make all comes from the earth. We reform it, and we do chemical things to it, but we get those chemicals from the earth. And we think up ways to make new stuff, right? So, I think that's a wonderful gift to us. So here's what I want, here's what I want you to do this week. When you go outdoors, when you step outside, whether you're leaving here or leaving your home to go to school or you're leaving school to go home or whatever, when you step outside, I want you to say to yourself, hmm, thank you, God, for giving us everything. Everything. Thank you, God, for giving us everything, because everything we need is right on this planet, and we're just tenting on it temporarily. Yeah. Thank you, God, for giving us everything we need. Can you remember that for me? All right. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for the earth. Thank you for the gift of the earth. Help us to, to uh, use it wisely, to care for it wisely, 
to share it with others generously. Thank you for your generosity in giving it to us. Help us to always be thankful for the gift of the earth, our home. Through Jesus, our friend, amen. All right, so what's going to remind us of God this week? When we do what? What's going to be our trigger? If we leave somewhere. You leave somewhere and go where? Go where? Go. Outside. Outside, outdoors. When we step outdoors, and what are we going to say to ourselves? What are we going to say? Thank you, Jesus, for everything. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. Thank you, God, for giving us everything. Yeah. Thank you all for helping me out with this today. Oh. 
So friends, uh, we often think of religion, faith, as those things about which we are certain, those things, those truths, if you will, about which we are absolutely sure. And that's not incorrect. There's that aspect of faith, those things that we find foundational for our living. But today's Bible lessons remind us that it's okay to ask questions, that it's okay to ask questions of Jesus, that it's okay to ask questions of faith. In today's gospel lesson, God's people have been waiting for a Messiah for hundreds of years. This long-awaited special leader that God was going to provide which had been foretold them in the Hebrew Bible. And Jesus' followers have begun to realize that He, Jesus, is that special one, that He is that Messiah. In fact, the Apostle Peter has said it out loud. He's blurted that out. And Jesus has begun to try to reframe what Messiah means. He's already told his closest followers that that he must die and rise again to new life. But but they don't understand what he means. Their understanding was that the Messiah is a victor, a victorious leader. The concept of the Messiah dying just completely is over their head. Now, they knew that John the baptizer... Jesus' relative and and advanced team, if you will, had been killed by King Herod, was not, well, let's just say it was dangerous to be a prophet. But the Messiah, the Messiah was thought to be a victorious ruler, not a martyr. And it's against this background that Jesus takes his three closest friends with him, Peter, James, and John, and like scouts... They go camping. They go camping together up on a mountain. And there, some very strange things happen. First of all, Jesus begins to glow in the dark and the fog. Okay? That's weird. That's just weird. And a little frightening. And then... Two folk from the Hebrew Bible who lived centuries before Moses and Elijah, they appear talking with Jesus. That's really weird. And the Bible, and I love that it says this in so many words, that Peter, who is scared out of his wits, starts rambling on about, well, let's build three booths, a shelter for each of the three of you. He's like, what, you, you're going to build a condo up here? That's your response to all this crazy? But that's Peter. And then a cloud covers them, and a voice out of the cloud, presumably the voice of God, says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then poof, suddenly... They're all alone again with just Jesus. Well, Elijah, who is one of those two figures, Elijah also features in our first lesson today. He is said to be a man who never died because God took him to heaven, it says, in a whirlwind with a chariot of fire and horses of fire. But you know... The story of Elijah being taken to heaven in a whirlwind, although perhaps does not involve death, it has within it all the poignancy and all the pathos of an expected death, an anticipated death, an expected parting like that that occurs when we know a loved one has a terminal illness. 
We know they're going to die. We know what is going to kill them. We don't know exactly when, but we know it's coming, and rather sooner than later. This story has all those same sort of elements. First of all, Elijah's close friend, Elisha, he knows that Elijah is going to be taken from him. He knows it, and he does not want to talk about it. And sometimes that's what folk do. They know their loved one is dying, and it's too painful. They don't want to talk about it. Other times, folk want to talk about it all the time. It just depends on the person, right? And then there are those people, like Elisha's fellow prophets, who say obvious and unhelpful things. You notice in the story, they keep showing up to say, do you know that Elijah's going to be dead? Yeah, shut up. I'm a prophet too. I know. It gets even in, more interesting if we continue the reading on because when Elijah disappears, then they shame Elisha into looking for him. He knows he's gone. It's like, oh, come on, people. But that's what folk do to us sometimes. Maybe we've done it not meant to. And then Elisha clings to Elijah and seeks a parting blessing from him, much as many of us will stay beside the bed of someone we know is dying and will hang on their last words, right? Maybe there's a word for me in what they have to share. Or as sometimes happen in, happens in this day and age, We'll stand by the bed of a dying loved one and watch the monitor, right? Watch the heart rhythm. Watch the breathing rhythm. Watch them go flat. I've seen that. Yeah. And then when Elijah is finally taken away, Elisha cries out in grief and anguish and, and in a sign of mourning, he tears his clothes in two. So, these two Bible stories, the one of Elijah, the one of Jesus, these are stories of life and death. Life and death. Life and death are big ideas for us human beings. And those two realities, life and death, they raise big questions for us. And so, today, our attention is drawn to what happens when Jesus and his friends are coming down from the mountain after their strange camp out. On their way down, Jesus demands that they don't tell anyone what they've seen. Now, why would this special vision be given them, and it is special, if they weren't to share it? That is very counterintuitive to much of what the Bible has to say and much of what our faith has to say about sharing the good news and telling the story, sharing our God experiences, our God moments. No, he says, don't, don't, don't share this. They're to keep it secret until after Jesus has risen from the dead. And then, and only then, can they share it. But here's the thing. Peter, James, and John, they have no frame of reference for this. They have no frame of reference for understanding what Jesus is saying. First of all, folk don't just rise from the dead. So that's, that's out of their scope of imagination. And secondly, the Messiah is not supposed to die. The Messiah is to be a victorious leader and ruler. Why would the Messiah need to rise from death? So Peter and James and John, these three premier apostles, the Bible says they discussed among themselves. They are muttering, I think, among themselves. They are whispering behind Jesus, hoping he can't hear the conversation. What in the world is he talking about? Right? That's what's going on. What in the world is Jesus talking about? And so they asked Jesus a question. Why do the religious experts say that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Now, I don't know about you, 
But I've always thought, what an odd question. Well, the, the logic behind it is this. If Jesus is the Messiah, God's special one, why haven't we seen Elijah return to earth to announce his coming? Because that's what, the, that's what all the Bible scholars have told us is supposed to happen first. And Jesus answers their question. Jesus says that John the baptizer was that Elijah figure, and he was killed. So returning to his earlier prediction, Jesus says, in effect, why wouldn't folk also treat the Messiah with abuse and contempt? They killed the one sent to announce his coming. Now, folk, Jesus' friends here are doing, they're doing something very human, something we all do sometimes. They're avoiding asking a direct question, one that would have gone to the heart of the matter, that, that could have touched on their real need, their real concern. They could have asked more directly, why did Eli if you're the Messiah, why did, why did Elijah not come already? Or they might have said, and I think this is what's really on their mind that day, are you really the Messiah? But they don't. Instead, they ask an oblique question about what the religious scholars say. Sometimes, sometimes, especially when we are afraid, either afraid of the answer or afraid of the person of whom we're asking the question, we will ask oblique questions, questions that come in kind of from a, a safe angle in a safe place. So growing up, I felt that way a little bit about my father. I found him a little bit intimidating. He was a country doctor, and there was obviously much that he could not share about his patients because physicians keep confidences, right? And the, it was a small town. Well, one stoplight is a very small town. Uh, and, and his patients were our friends and neighbors and fellow church members and classmates. So he didn't say much. And he had a lot of rhetorical tools for deflecting questions from five nosy children in the household, okay? I remember one time my classmate Dennis was in the hospital, which sort of was odd. You know, we were in elementary school. He seemed healthy to me. He's in the hospital. And I asked my dad, well, what's wrong with Dennis? And my dad said to me, oh, he's got a bone in his leg. And I took him to mean, oh, he must have been walking down along the bay and stepped on a fishbone because that happened. And I, later on, I thought, no, wait a minute. It's the middle of winter. He wouldn't have been in his bare feet on the beach. That was just a joke answer, right? Of course, we have bones in our legs. That was just a way of putting me off. All right. But Dad's greatest tool for deflecting questions was to simply not answer them. And he got away with that because he was deaf in one ear. And we could never tell if he actually couldn't hear the question or if he was just pretending. <laughs> and you know, he wasn't a person you wanted to nag, right? So you didn't ask it twice. And he worked long hours, sometimes 80 hours a week, he wasn't around a lot. The time with him was precious. And when he was with us, he was often preoccupied. So I would think hard about exactly what question it was I wanted to ask him and what was the right moment to ask it. So sometimes, you know, in the back seat of the car, you can lob a question while someone is busy driving and you don't have to make eye contact. That's a good technique. You all remember that. Because they <laughs> don't scare your parents too much. By for, you know, they don't want to cause them to go off the road. But, you know, that's a good time to lob one of those questions, right? Or sometimes it was in the barn when he was repairing yet some other piece of broken equipment around the household, whether it was the lawnmower or something else, and he's busy tinkering. I could lob a question in and see 
what answer I got. I imagine Jesus' friends who are muttering behind Jesus among themselves, coming up with this question, right? This oblique question for Jesus. And Jesus answers. In truth, he tells them more than they can take in. Only later will it make sense. And that is why he tells them to keep their experience on the mountain secret until later. Only then, only then, after his death on the cross and his resurrection, will it make any sense. And isn't that the way it is so many times in life and in faith, that things only make sense in hindsight? Or at least they make more sense in hindsight. But the crucial point here is that Jesus answers their question. He doesn't ignore it. He is not deaf to their question. He answers it. God is not deaf to our questions and concerns. Now, the answers we get may not make sense right now, but our questions are always welcome. We are always encouraged to ask our questions of life and death and faith. We are always encouraged to come to God in prayer. We are always, always invited. God is always open to us. We are always encouraged to ask our questions. Thanks be to God. For faith, faith as much as it seems to be about certainty, is also about those things of which we're not sure. And it is okay to ask questions of Jesus. It is okay to ask questions of faith. It is okay to share our doubts with God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now as a praying people and a caring congregation, I'm going to share with you some concerns and joys of which I'm aware and invite you, if you recognize some of these folk, to reach out to them with a call or a card to let them know they're in our prayers or that we're sharing their joys. I learned this morning that Wayne, the son of Joyce, has experienced a stroke and it has affected his right side. Also, uh, I bid your prayers for Tyler the 19-year-old boyfriend of a niece of Annabelle and Chet. Tyler is in Johns Hopkins Bayview Intensive Care after a very serious automobile accident, uh, but he is progressing toward healing, so we praise God for that. But he, he needs more prayers, and I know, Chet and Annabelle, you'll take our prayer love on to Tyler. I bid your prayers for Jared, Linda's husband. Uh, they live down in Florida. He is recovering from surgery he had this past Friday uh, to repair... Uh, issues, complications with a knee replacement, and the surgery went well. We praise God for that, but he's still in recovery, and some of you I know have Linda's email. We'll reach out to her. I bid your continued prayers for Mitch, the husband of Jessica. Uh, he's in rehab up at Calvert Manor, in nursing ho- uh, Calvert Manor Nursing Home up in Rising Sun, and I bid your prayers for his wife, Jessica, and some of you know Mitch and Jessica, and I know you'll reach out to them. I bid your prayers for Steve, uh, Judy's husband, who is recovering after his cancer treatment is done, we praise God that it is done, but there's still a recovery process, and I know, Judy, you'll take our prayer love to Steve. I bid your prayers for Gail, the wife of Leonard. Um, she is recovering from successful surgery. If you can reach out to Gail and Len, I'd appreciate that. I bid your prayers for Reverend Stacy, the pastor of Salem United Methodist Church in Upper Falls in Kingsville, who is recovering from bilateral uh, jaw joint replacement last week. Praise God, the healing is going well. She is able to speak, and they did, after a few days, they unwired her jaw, so that's all good news. I bid your prayers for Wyatt, the child of a friend of Michaela. He underwent surgery to correct one issue, and they found a much more other, many more other issues, and um, her last text to me said his pain is better, but um, there are no answers yet, so please keep Wyatt in your prayers. I bid your prayers for Rodney, who is recovering after successful surgery last week, and for Alan, a friend of John and Carolyn, who is undergoing some very challenging chemo and treatment of his cancer, but takes inspiration from his little grandnephew, Drew, who is also battling cancer. So the older one is being inspired by the little one, and we praise God for that. And I know, John, you'll take our prayer love to Alan. I bid your prayers for all those households that are battling COVID and other viruses in this season. I bid your prayers for travel mercies for Ron and Mary Bell, who are going to Australia and Singapore for his work. 
And I bid your prayers for scouts and their leaders and their parents and their families. We have a number of joys today. I want to share with you this card that we received at the church. Because of you, I feel especially blessed. Thank you so much for your thoughts and prayers. It really does matter, and it does help me through this time in my life. God bless all of you from Bill, uh, who lost his wife, Gail, recently. It's a joy to share with you that Drew, the grandnephew of John's friend, Alan, I mentioned Drew earlier, the doctors are very confident of the treatment. We praise God for that. Now, there's some significant side effects that have caused physical issues, but Drew has received a service dog named Snoopy. So he now has a service dog to help him deal with that. So we praise God for that. It's a joy to share with you that Peg, the wife of Jim, got good news after her recent cancer surgery. No more radiation is needed. So we praise God for that. It's a joy to share with you that Casey, the wife of Jack, and the daughter-in-law of Jamie and John is recovering very well. Thank you for your prayers. It's a joy to share with you that Scott, the husband of Amy, the son of Bonnie and Norman, the father of Josh and Lydia, is back to work after ankle surgery. This man wants to work. He was told he couldn't drive, so he's making his wife take him to and from work. Okay, but he is able to work, so praise God for that. It's a joy to share with you that Ella, the daughter of Renee and Paul, made the honor roll this past term, and that her younger sister Charlotte made the honor roll and was named student of the quarter in social studies. So we praise God for that. It's a joy to share with you that Bonnie, the daughter of Megan, has been selected to attend North Hartford High School this coming fall in the Large Animal Science Magnet Program. Go duck farmers, <laughs> right? And it's a joy to share with you that Taylor has auditioned and gotten into the Cecil All-County Elementary Band as a percussionist. Praise God for that. It's a joy to share with you that Dan and Leslie celebrated their 53rd wedding anniversary this past Thursday. <laughs> It's a joy to share with you that Sarah Kay, uh, one of our former church administrators and the mother of Judy and Barb, is turning 90 years young on Tuesday. <laughs> Happy birthday to Sarah Kay. Very good. And finally, I want to take a moment as a joy and ask those who are presently scouts, formerly scouts, present scout leaders, former scout leaders, or current parents or former parents of scouts or families, if you would stand, please. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please be seated. I just, I want you to see how, how scouting touches so many lives in our society, so praise God for that. And now let's go to God in silent prayer. As we share with God any concerns or joys I've not named aloud. Holy God, you are our comforter in grief, our healer in sickness, and our support in the midst of discouragement. Console, renew, and inspire all who struggle with health or loneliness, fear, or worry. Keep safe and guide all those who travel or who are camping out in nature or who serve as leaders of young people. Teach us that the world is our home and help us all, your children, to grow into fullness of life. Bless the work of scouting here and around the globe, that through its efforts, young people may grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with you and their peers. Thank you. Thank you for the ministry of scouting to build character, to open our eyes to our responsibility to those in need, and to encourage genuine patriotism and vital faith. Thank you for faithful parents and leaders that guide young people in the ways of truth and righteousness. Thank you for healing and for the achievements of diligent study and faithful practice. Thank you for love promises made and kept and for the gathering wisdom of the many years. Thank you, Lord God, when community gathers around in the form of neighbors and friends and church family to support us in times of great challenge or loss. 
And thank you most of all. Thank you most of all for your grace in the person of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now please stand in heart or body as we sing together, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, which is based upon our first scripture lesson. Please be seated. And now I'm going to call on some scouts. There are six scouts who are designated to lead us in the divine wisdom of scouting. So if you all will come on up and take your turns at the microphone. You all are going to be scouts when we respond, right? But they'll be the leaders, right? They're going to do the leader part. We'll do the scout part. So scouts who are going to lead the divine wisdom of scouting, if you will come on up and you can line up here and just take turns getting close to the mic. The scout law is a 
guiding light to millions of children and young adults throughout the world today. But the principles of law have come to us from ancient days. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. A scout is trustworthy. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. A scout is loyal. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. A scout is helpful. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. How, how very good and pleasant is it when kinder live together in you. A scout is friendly. Let no evil talk come out of our mouth. Uh, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. As there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Now it is courteous. The righteous know to, ne to the needs of their animals, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Now it is kind. Children, obey their, your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it, will, it may be well with you, and you may long live on the earth. A scout is obedient. A glad heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. A scout is cheerful. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her food in summer and gathers her substances in harvest. Scout is thrifty. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Scout is brave. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear de deceitfully. A scout is clean. And you shall love your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength, this is the first commandment. Scout is reverent. He is reverent toward God. He is faithful in his religious duties and respects the convictions of others in matters of custom and religion. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to invite the scout leaders to come forward. So I'm, if, if they are present, the pack committee chair, the troop committee chair, the cub master, the scout master for troop 967G, and the scout master for troop 967B, okay, and any den leaders who are present, and also our scout master emeritus. No, yeah, that's you, Clark. <laughs> And our former uh, scout liaison. Come on up, Nolan. Do we have any den leaders here? Anybody willing to admit? Oh, I see. That's a call him out. Okay, he's a den leader. All right. See, yeah, okay. See, this is the fun part because you get to call out anybody who's not coming up. You're up here. You can go, hey, hey, because I don't know who they are. Folks, it takes a village, right? I want you to see, I mean, scouting is an amazing, amazing organization. And all this leadership is present and part of it. And I just want you to see that. And, you know, we, we've got a pack represented here. We've got two troops. And then 
0.965 is also represented. So we've got another troop represented at least. So that's pretty cool today. I do have a special presentation, and I don't know who to hand this to, so I'm going to hand it to Heidi. All right. <laughs> That's my default, right? So the PAC and Troop 967G participated in our Christmas Angel Project, providing hats, gloves, wrapping paper, tape, tags, and bows. And also want to note that uh, the PAC and Troops 967G, 967B, and 965 have participated through the year in property maintenance, such as raking leaves and picking up sticks, and going Christmas caroling. So that's all a part of the life of our congregation. So thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you. Give them a hand. Yeah. And in, in the bag, in the bag are patches for each of the scouts that relate to the Christmas Angel Project. That's what the patches are for. Yeah, we always try to honor that each year. So thank you very much. You all can have a seat. Yep, give them a hand. Good. And now let us continue to praise God by the giving of our time, talent, and treasure as we ponder the question that's up on the screen.
Holy God, you have given, you have given us, us hearts to search for you and minds to find answers, answers to our questions. Thank you for your gifts of intellect and reason. Thank you for opening your heart to us and opening your word to us today. Use us in our gifts to show your love to others in acts of care and respect. Through Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. So after the closing blessing, which is going to be just a second, after the closing blessing, uh, we're all invited to sing the Scout Vespers. And um, we're going to put the lyrics up, at least for the first stanza. I didn't realize it had two. I only know one. So we put, we put the lyrics up for you. And you know the tune. It's the tune to Oh Christmas Tree. Okay? <laughs> or for those of you who know, it's the tune of the state anthem, Maryland, My Maryland, also. So... You will, you will be able to participate instead of making Clark do a solo like we've done so many years. All right. The benediction. May we go now from this place as good examples of true scouts. When facing deceit and dishonesty, be trustworthy. If, if we see hypocrisy and faithlessness, be loyal. Where we find materialism and be firstism, be helpful. When we find people in despair, be friendly. In a world with ill manners, be courteous. Where we find brutality and crudeness, be kind. Th through corner cutting and rule scoffing, be common, be obedient. When we see our environment, environment blighted with waste and extravagance, be thrifty. 
where we find anger and temptation in the world, be brave. As we, so, as we see filth and, pop, and pollution of God's creation, be clean. In a world that worship things, be reverent to the true God. May we go now from this place as good examples of true scouts. And may peace of God that passes all understanding be with us now and always. Amen. Amen. Softly falls the light of day as our campfire fades away. Are we done? I guess. I guess. I guess.